Welcome back, everybody. This is Derek Kirby of the Dallas Prospect back for a little bit of Mavericks talk here as we have some interesting Mavericks breaking news. The, the cavalry has arrived, at least for the most part, not completely, but for the most part. And uh, today we're going to be talking with Jimmy Crowther of all things Mavs. Jimmy, how are you doing today? Man, I'm good. Thanks for having me on. I'm, uh, I'm excited to get our guys back tonight or three fourths, I guess, of our guys. So excited to watch some Mavs basketball on this Wednesday night. Yeah, absolutely. So it's uh, it, it's been a while since we've had these guys. It, it's been nine games, not great, under 500 in that stretch, four and five. And while they have had a couple highs in, in terms of playing well, if not coming away with the win, like the Milwaukee game um, or the great win against the Spurs a couple nights ago, They've had good moments, but where they've still continued to kind of struggle is the defensive end, which had been a strength for them early in the year and really just kind of closing things out. It's still the clutch crunch time, whatever you want to call it, uh, that this team continues to struggle. So how, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on like what we might can expect tonight with these guys coming back into the mix? Yeah. You know, I said it on my channel on all things Mavs. I, I think the biggest thing, for me is yes, their play is going to be a huge boost to this team to be able to have Josh Richardson, who's an underrated playmaker come back and also be defending the best guard on the other team, which would have been Donovan Mitchell against the jazz, but he's now out. And then yeah. Dorian Finney Smith being, in my opinion, I think the best defender on the wings in general, uh, as you know, being able to guard basically two through four and some small ball fives, if you really wanted to, that's the defensive presence right there. And then obviously Dwight Powell comes back. We've all had our fair share of frustrations with Dwight Powell, but the other thing, not just outside of their play, is the fact that I think this team gets rejuvenated as a whole. Because right. I think a lot of these games that the Mavs were going into in these nine games without those guys, I, a lot of times in the first quarter, they looked like they were prepared to play and struggle because they knew they were missing so many guys. And they were like, ah, this game's a wash. Right. And so I think this coming, them coming back is just a boost of confidence um, along with the ability to have you know, your third leading scorer in Josh Richardson, who I would assume should be the third leading scorer on a regular basis. And now Dorian Finney-Smith, hopefully his three ball comes around a little bit more. It wasn't great when he was healthy, but to have his three point shooting back as well is absolutely huge. And then, you know, Colley Stein, I was on the Colley Stein train early on, but as we've seen more extended time of Colley Stein, it's yeah. not as pretty. And now you kind of see why he struggled. And so now you have an option at least with Dwight Powell back in the mix. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, bringing back in, like you said, Dorian Finney-Smith, that that definitely gives you one of your, I mean, both of your best perimeter defenders, no disrespect to Luca and the major strides he's made this year. Uh, bringing them back into the mix is going to help this team tremendously. The the guy you're still missing in this equation, Maxi, you know, that's, that's another great defender for you as well. And you mentioned Willie Cauley-Stein dropping off. I, I think a lot of that shows that the success Willie had in the starting lineup initially, a lot of that can be credited to the presence of Maxi, I think, and how, mm -hmm. you know, with him on the, on the other side of the front court for him, it really helped Willie Cauley Stein because he has not looked the same in recent games playing now without Maxi. And so, and that's another guy as well that helps you stretch the floor a little bit as well. So yeah. that's, that's a big loss, not having Maxi in. We'll see when he comes back, but even with, like the corner threes that that was Dorian Finney Smith's bread and butter last year, as far as that was concerned in his career, best three point shooting season. So adding him back into the mix for a team that has not shot the corner three well all year is certainly going to help. I'll be curious to see how many minutes these guys play coming back. Mm -hmm. I know, I know uh, like Josh Richardson posted, I think a week ago or something on his Instagram, you know, his post COVID conditioning and just looks like he's about to die. So I, I can totally get that. I, it would not surprise me in the least if they're still on a bit of a, a pitch count, so to speak, as far as their minutes. And if uh, it is a bit of a gradual kind of ramping back up process, that might take a little bit of more time than just a guy who, you know, oh, he might miss two weeks and he has to get back into shape. Everyone understands that. But it might be just a different equation just because of this added factor where it depends on what their health was. I, I don't know which of them Carlisle had referenced that one of them was sicker with, uh, with COVID than the other. I think based on what I was seeing earlier, I think uh, Dorian was the one who was more or less okay. And that it was Richardson who might've been sicker. So we'll see how that impacts him, but yeah, he's a guy who should be your third leading scorer most nights. And if it's not him, it's probably going to be Hardaway, but they should be right there as a one, two punch filling that number three score role. So 
if this team can get something and finally be healthy for a change, finally actually build momentum off a healthy roster, then maybe they can turn a corner because as you were talking about before we jumped on here, the strength of schedule looks good uh, moving forward. Do you want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, man. I mean, reading up on the uh, the Ringer's article, and the Ringer did a really good research on all this, and basically laid out every team's strength of schedule up to this point. And Dallas had the fifth strongest schedule, so basically playing a top five, you know, in terms of difficulty when it comes to strength of schedule. Um, so everyone's hitting the panic button. Mavs are a game under five hundred. That's expected with you know the amount of injuries they've had, and with you know KP not being one hundred and ten percent as we expect him to be. But people don't even overlook – they just overlook the fact that their schedule's been pretty strong too. Now, they've had some losses that they shouldn't have lost. Like, there's probably no excuse to lose to Chicago. There's no excuse to lose to Charlotte early on. Like, right. those are inexcusable losses no matter who's healthy and who's not. Um, but going forward – now, obviously, this week is a tall task. But going forward, the Mavs have the 29th strongest schedule. So, second to last. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty pretty darn good. And there should be no excuses on the table, especially when you have – like, if Maxie's out, that's fine. Like – no team, rarely are teams 100% healthy. Right. So, yes, it's a key player, but you got to find a way to win these games if you're going to have the 29th strongest schedule uh, going forward. Again, probably past this week because this week is it's still tough, but they're winnable games. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a major factor for sure because everybody's gut reaction has been to slam that panic button just incessantly with every loss. And you, as you said, there's been some very inexcusable losses. That's why you're now – and health, of course, didn't help you when you did have to face tough matchups or seven games in 11 days, whatever it was. Uh, but now being in a situation where moving forward, you do have a much easier schedule for a good stretch of your season, too. That opens things up tremendously where now you can build on it. You don't have to overreact because you've survived. You've weathered this storm. And now you're going to have an opportunity to maybe start to build on something. And the West is a train wreck anyway, in terms of mm -hmm. the, the difference between four and 10. I mean, all yeah. these, all these teams are just smashed together, basically separated by like two and a half games or something. If you stretch uh, in that span. And I think the Mavericks are currently the at 10th in the West right now, something like that. So it's, it's by no means out of their reach, even though everyone wants to have the reaction of, hey, they're not playing well right now. They're losing games they should be winning. Ergo, we need to either blow it up or we need to fire Rick, like all these overreactions. And if you try to, if you try to approach it in, as what I've seen, if you try to approach it kind of in that middle ground of like, well, hold on, they just got to weather the storm, helps coming back. Then the reaction is that you're you're playing the role of like the company man and not wanting to criticize the team. I'll criticize yeah. the team plenty when I think it's yeah. deserved, but I, I don't think 15, 16 games into a year, whatever, uh, you can make any sort of judgment on it, even in a shortened season due to uh, the pandemic and everything. They've got more than enough time and with that strength of schedule, more than enough opportunity to really move forward and surge into the West. Yeah, and well, not only can we not make you know generalizations about this team because of how short the season's been, we can't make generalizations about this team because we haven't seen them 100%. Like, even when Maxi and Jay Rich and Doe and Dwight Powell were all healthy, there was still no Porzingis, who was right. your second option on this team, and that changes everything that this Mavs team does and did. Um, and then Porzingis comes back immediately – they lose five guys, mm -hmm. including Jalen Brunson back, you know, when that happened. Um, and so I, I, we still don't know what this team is at all. And so making generalizations off the first 17 games, you know, usually I would be able to say, I would say, usually I say within 15 games of a season, we kind of know what a team's going to look like. In this case, we absolutely do not. And so tonight right. against Utah will be that first time that we really say, all right, here's what this team is. But even, even right now, you know, you got to give these other guys time to kind of come back and be healthy. So, yeah, I'm definitely not slamming the panic button. But I will say the Mavs got to take advantage of all the games that they can. Um, you know, I kind of look back on that on that Rockets game where, you know, Old Depot and Christian Wood were out. And so yeah. Dallas was like, you know what? This is a game where we can rest Chris Ops Porzingis. And they didn't take advantage, you know, full advantage of a win that could have been had. Um, right. And that's a game that another inexcusable loss because they rested Porzingis thinking it would be an easy win. Obviously, the Mavs lost that game. So, yeah, like you were saying, with the standings, I mean, here's the deal. Mavs are 10th in the West, yes, but they are two games, two games out of fourth place, which is yep. the Denver Nuggets, uh, and then four and a half games out of first. Now, they're not going to get first place in the Western Conference, but it just kind of puts into perspective how nobody has really formed anything. Like, 
right now, Memphis, Phoenix, Golden State are all in the playoffs above Dallas. Like, mm-hmm. I think Dallas is better than all three of those teams. Yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty fair. They certainly their ceiling is certainly higher. I feel. And health is is a big thing. We haven't seen this team, to your point, we haven't seen them completely together this year because I almost feel like they brought KP back a touch early. You know, they still seem like they were kind of waffling on it, like, ah, you know, somewhere in the next couple of weeks. And then it's like, oh, we're losing like five guys. Uh, All right, KP's ready. Here you go. It kind of felt like he was shoehorned in, but you know, I, I think he was, I think he was probably good to go. I just think they're taking an abundance of caution, which to your point, like that, uh, that Houston game, they looked at it and they made the determination of, you know, we're going to try and as much as possible, keep him on a bit of a pitch count. And so thinking that that was a game that they could certainly win, they were willing to rest him there and just say, ah, five games in seven days. That's a lot to ask of a guy, um, you know, coming back as he is off of a knee injury. So I understand it, but it absolutely backfired on him. And I think the team showed through most of that game. Yeah, they made that push that cut it to three in the third quarter, but you saw through most of that game, they looked like a team playing in their fifth game in seven days. They were gassed. Yeah. And once they didn't get quite over the hump on that first, uh, that that last charge there before the Rockets closed out, like on a 30 to 12 run or something in the third quarter, it's like once they failed to get over the hump and then it swung back to like five or six points, they were done. It was over. Yeah. So yeah. I'm curious to see like, all right, once the team gets back health wise, you know, what, what does it look like? Because there's, there's a lot, there's a lot this team can do with, uh, with the talent it has. Like there's all kinds of discussion about like, do they need to make a big trade? Do they need a third superstar? Well, one, we don't know what the team even looks like right now in it's full form. And two, I think unless I think like any year, unless you have something just insane fall in your lap where it's a very good gettable deal, kind of like the KP acquisition at the time mm-hmm. was, I think you probably stick with more of continuity because I think this team probably feels burned by past shakeups like the Rondo deal. And so I think they're probably going to say like, let's stay the course because if we actually have that health, like if you had the defensive turnaround from this roster that we've seen this year when healthy and you match it with KP and Lucas circa the bubble, that's a contender to me. Like that's a team that can take on anybody. So I don't think you necessarily have to go get a third superstar as long as you've got enough good parts, good role players to fill out the roster. And I think most anybody on this roster can fit a role if you're allowing them to stay within that role. Even a Wes Awundu can give you something of value if you don't ask him to play 30 minutes and do more than, you know, he should be asked to, frankly. Right. So, yeah, it's a... it's interesting to see one of the major guys with regard to a, a role player. He's kind of in that tweener range uh, is Jalen Brunson, who has played very well this year when in the starting lineup, there's discussion now about whether or not he should go back to the bench, even with Richardson and Dorian Finney Smith coming back. I tend to err on the side that he should return to the bench. Not that he's done anything to play his way out of it, but I think this team, you know, offensively, for a number of reasons, several of which we've covered here, this team has not been the same offense it was last year. That was top three in scoring offense. And of course, we we know the point of most efficient offense in NBA history. Right. It has not been that team this year, but they were, when healthy, the second best defensive rating in the league. So it's like, okay, if defense is your strength now, every year is different. If defense is your strength now, give me as much of that as possible and we'll figure out the offense as we go. And if that means Brunson playing in and out of the starting lineup, depending on matchups, I'm totally cool with that, but I want to keep my elite perimeter defenders out there in the lineup. Yeah. What do you think? So, so let me ask you, so if you take Brunson off the bench, are you keeping Tim Hardaway in there? Is that, is that kind of your, uh, so let's see if, if Brunson's on the bench, uh, or you're saying putting Brunson in the starting lineup? No, no. If you, so if you put Brunson in the starting five or in the, in the, in the, in the on the bench, sorry, yeah. who are you? putting in the lineup in the starting five you're starting five i'm guessing if brunson is on the bench is going to be probably luca you'll have finney richardson uh i'd like to see maxi kp probably i think that's probably what i do okay so i think depending on matchup as well if jalen brunson's on the bench i'm probably putting tim hardaway in there Mm -hmm. um and i think i would go luca tim richardson finney smith KP solely at the five. 
Now, obviously, you're playing a team like New Orleans to a Zion, Steven Adams. You're going to put Maxi and KP in there. Like yeah. that's just going to be based on lineups. It's going to be fluid. Um, but when it comes to Jalen Brunson, if you do take him off the bench, you stick him in the starting lineup permanently. You lose so much playmaking off the bench. Like James Johnson is yeah. probably your best playmaker. Like Trey Burke is a good guard. He's a great scoring guard. Yeah. I, I like. Well, inconsistently great scoring guard, I should say. But in all honesty, he's not a point guard. He's an undersized mm-hmm. two guard is what Trey Burke is. And James yeah. Johnson is just an oversized point guard. And it's like, so James Johnson is your primary playmaker, which I don't think you want being the case. So I think I err with you. I think I err on the side of Jalen Brunson off the bench as well. And your bench unit is Brunson and Burke. And then James Johnson comes in with those guys, mix in, you know, Maxie, Dwight Powell, um, those kind of five. But also, you know, you think about it, Rick staggers KP and Luca enough with the bench too, to where you can mix it up either way. So yeah. I say when everybody's healthy, take Jalen Brunson off the bench. If he struggles, if he's just bad again, mm-hmm. put him back in the starting lineup, see what he can do. See if Tim Hardaway jr. Off the bench works just fine and, and mix the, that mix him in. Um, but as of right now, when fully healthy, I would like Luca, Tim Richardson, Finney Smith and Porzingis, which I think will be the starting five we get tonight against Utah now that most people are healthy. Um, and I think Maxi off the bench helps both Dwight Powell and Colley Stein. Like you mentioned it at the top when we were talking about Colley Stein, like mm-hmm. sinners look better next to Maxi Klebo. Um, yeah. And I think that would be a benefit of bringing him off the bench as well. So yeah, I'm with you, but I really love what we got from Jalen Brunson. And I think one of the most encouraging sure. things about what we've seen from Brunson, you know, he comes back 10 day quarantine. He never tested positive. He didn't show any symptoms. He was fine. Mm-hmm. But he comes back and he's ready to play and he's been great since his return. Now, obviously, like you say, he's been the starting five. So that makes a little bit of a difference, I'm sure. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, similar production that we got from Brunson is what we get from these next two, three, if you count pal guys that are coming back into the lineup as well. Yeah. Brunson's having a, a great year overall, whether or not he's been in the starting lineup, he's, he's right on the cusp right now. And it's super early, obviously, but he's right on the cusp of uh, the 50, 40, 90 club, I believe. So yeah. yeah, he's, he's having a great year. It's career highs for him across the board. So that's great. I, I agree though, that I think it works better with him. The playmaker coming in off the bench, uh, the pairing of him and Trey Burke is very interesting. Burke to your point is not really a, a true point guard. When he tried to yeah, be a true he's... point guard, he nearly took himself out of the league. Um, yeah. And it, it kind of took Dallas to sort of rescue his career in that regard. And, uh, you know, that, that's a great weapon for them. And it just shows that literally every part of the, the KP trade is turned into tremendous value for them. What I would like to see Dallas do, and, and they've struggled with this this year, as, as we mentioned, like some of those bad losses, the Chicago losses, the Charlotte loss. Um, I would like to see this team not play to the level of its competition. That's great when you're playing a good team and you're playing up at their level. Like when you go to Milwaukee and severely depleted, find yourself saying like, Hmm, we probably should have won that game. Huh? Like we were right there. That's great when it's like that, but when it's playing down to your competition and now you're messing around with them and you're losing games against bad teams or teams that because of the circumstances, be they the Houston situation where you're letting Boogie Cousins, who had been in a severe rut, kick your ass up and down the court. Now you're starting to step into a major problem. And I think that's part of also what frustrates fans so much is that they don't see that consistency. It seems like this team uh, doesn't play doesn't play up to their potential nearly as often as they should and so while the 29th uh strongest schedule remaining is great and that's very promising there's still an onus on them to actually follow through with it and you know take care of business because talent wise and all healthy ceiling all that i think this is a team that coming into the year could have been uh as high as the three seed i i felt like coming in we'll see what they end up doing. Health has obviously been a huge factor with that, with the past couple of weeks really gutting them and everything, but you're a game below 500. You're still right there in a crowded West. So plenty of room, plenty of time. It's just, okay. Can you go handle what you've got to handle now? Uh, Let's see. So speaking of tonight's game, the jazz game here, we, you referenced it earlier on Donovan Mitchell is out with a concussion does that between your guys coming back, is there an emotional lift you think that helps this team that even though it's in Utah and the jazz are 13 and four this year have been riding a tremendous uh, win streak. 
Do you think that this is something that they can take advantage of it like they failed to do in that Houston game without Oladipo and Christian Wood and uh, actually get back in the win column? I'm going to predict a win. Uh, I, I do think this is a team that the Mavs are going to wake up for. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's another thing that comes with, you know, just playing against, you know, playing down to your competition. It's like sometimes you're going to play Charlotte or Chicago, whoever it may be. It's like, yeah, you don't get up for those games. Like you're not hyped up for those games. And that's, it's not an excuse. It's a terrible excuse, right. but it's realistic. Utah, they're going to have to lose eventually. They're on a nine game win streak. Mm-hmm. And so hopefully Dallas is like, Hey, we want to be that team that breaks their nine game win streak. They did it in Milwaukee last year. Milwaukee was riding an 18 game win streak. Lakers had a long win that streak one. too, I think what was when it? they beat them there. I don't remember how long the Lakers win streak was. Maybe it was a home win streak I'm thinking of, but it was something where yeah. Dallas early last year had the distinction of winning in LA and at Milwaukee. And both of them had been like nails at home with Dallas being like the one team that bit both. Yeah. Yeah, so hopefully they have that same mindset coming into Utah. And like you said, the revitalization or the, the rejuvenation of these guys back in the lineup will be kind of a wake-up call. Uh, I mean, look, here's the thing with Utah. They're still really good. They still have a lot of guys that can burn you. Mike Conley yeah. is leading the league in box plus minus. He has been playing back to Memphis. Mike Conley kind yep. of took a year for him to get adjusted, and he's back to it. Rudy Gobert, we know what he's going to do to Dallas. He always does the same thing to Dallas. Um, and KP's going to have to play strong and a mix of – I don't know. Maybe Boban gets some minutes in this game. I, I don't know what the answer is to Rudy Gobert. Maybe it's, hey, let Rudy Gobert get his and then contain everybody else. So yeah. it's not like a – I saw some people saying, no excuses not to win this game. I disagree. Utah is still really good. Yeah. Rudy's still an all-star. Mike Conley is still a high-level talent. Jordan Clarkson's averaging 17 points per game. I'm not going to say no excuses, but I will say I'm going to be disappointed if they don't come out with a win. Um, with no Donovan Mitchell, who's been averaging 27 points per game in this nine game win streak for Utah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and that average dragged down a little bit because in the game, he, I don't know when it happened exactly, but that game they won last over the Knicks, he was only like three of 15 or something. Like Mm -hmm. he struggled shooting and it wasn't until the next day that he felt the post concussion syndrome. So yeah, there, there's definitely an opportunity to get here and they are a good team. They're, they're not 13 and four, simply because of one guy. It is a good collection of guys that are well coached and have elevated their play this season. Conley, like you said, has returned to the Memphis Mike Conley, which was one of the best point guards in the league. So I'm, I'm very, I'm cautiously optimistic. And I think part of that comes from knowing this team, while the emotional lift is great, how will they handle it when adversity sets in late in the game? You know, like when you're in the fourth quarter and it's a very close game, but momentum is starting to swing back towards Utah. Are they going to be able to kind of get up off the mat? KP, I'm trying to think, I feel like KP, and maybe I'm wrong on this. Someone feel free to put the stats to fact check me or something. I feel like KP has struggled against Utah in, in his, you know, last season. And obviously I guess they haven't played him this year. So last season in that sample size, I feel like KP struggled against Utah in part because of the physicality um, of that. Are you, are you looking it up now? You know, I actually, on my pregame, uh, on my preview on my all things Mavs channel, uh, I actually had the notes up. So, okay, yeah, but I do remember he definitely struggled uh, in that one. Cause the Mavs last year, yeah, the Mavs for last year, they went one and two yeah. against the jazz. One, the one win they got was that one in the bubble where none of the Jazz starters played yep. after the second half, and J.J. Barea was starting for the Dallas Mavericks. Right. So that should give you kind of an idea. Porzingis, uh, in that first game, which the Mavs lost 112 to 107, he had 15 points, two rebounds. It's not a good game for Porzingis' standards. He didn't shoot mm-hmm. the ball well. Two uh, rebounds, and then second no. game, <laughs> Do what? Two rebounds, no. 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 <laughs> second game, he did have 28 points, but Dallas still lost. But Luka didn't play in that one. Okay. Um, so, so he yeah, was the you know focal this, point. Yeah, this kind of is what happened with Indiana. Last mm-hmm. year, Porzingis had two, two very different games against Indiana. One, he had 38, which I think was his season high. Mm-hmm. And the other one he had, I think it was like 14 points. So you're going to get one of two versions of KP, and I think that's going to be a similar story we get tonight. If he can stretch Gobert out past the arc, past the three-point arc, that's a recipe for success. Yeah, for sure. And he's just going to have to shoot better than like last game. He was like, yeah. O of eight, O of seven, something like that. One of eight. I don't, it was brutal is what I know. So he's going to have to find consistency on that. And that's one of those things too, where, you know, in the physical low post game, and I know the Mavericks talk about, or specifically Carlisle talks about how he doesn't 
value the post up opportunities much, even though Luca kind of has called KP's number in those situations at times this year to good success. I, I don't think that's going to be his strength in this game because of the physicality. So you're going to have to hope can KP knock down some of those shots, especially early to kind of draw Gobert away from the basket. And that's crucial for Dallas as well. Cause you're talking about one of the premier shot blockers in the league and just guys that will bother any shot. Even if he doesn't get a piece of it, he's going to make you flail and throw it over the backboard, trying to get it over his outstretched arm. So if they can do that and open up some, some scoring in the paint, maybe by drawing him out, then I feel better about it. But this team has not scored high, a high number of points per game in the, uh, the paint this year. The couple of exceptions they've had have been some of their coincidentally or not rather best games this year where they had the aberrations of like 68 points in the paint. Like, yeah. And I think that was the, the Pacers game without miles Turner. So you're, unless you can really stretch out their defense, I don't think you can bank on that kind of success, but it'll, it'll definitely open things up for this team. If it can actually establish its pacing and or, uh, its spacing and keep them honest, then it'll have an opportunity to, to do something. But without Donovan Mitchell on the, on the other side, this is an opportunity just from the stance of they don't have their usual firepower. And so all you have to do is be most of what you're capable of being for your offense. And yeah. you can at the very least give yourself a very good chance to get a win despite playing on the road. Yeah. So I'm curious to, I'm curious to see how they do. Cause this is a team that has been up and down this year. At times you watch a game, whether it be that Pacers game and you're like, Oh, it's finally coming together. This team looks like it's all starting to gel. KP's breaking through. He's finding some consistency this year, sort of like he was doing at the end of last year. And then you turn around and you get a dud like the the Houston game or like the Raptors game or something like that, where, you know, a team that shouldn't be able to play with you is just beating up on you. And it, it's not really much of a contest. So I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful we can start to establish if health is finally here, the reinforcements are here. Can they finally, for the first time, and it feels like a year and a half, if we're looking at just a calendar, have like a, a mostly, if not completely healthy team for a little stretch? Because so many times last year, we were trading off like, oh, Luca's out with an ankle. Oh, KP's out with uh, soreness in his knee. Okay, KP's back for a couple games. Oh, there goes Luca again. And it just felt like we were trading off in that so long last year. And, you know, it's, uh, it feels like it keeps an artificial ceiling over what they're able to do. And I get it. Every team, like you said, has health issues. No one's ever hundred percent healthy, especially by the time play, uh, playoffs are rolling around. But this is something where this team, their potential and just the two stars, I think is enough with the current composition of the roster. Maybe not enough to win it. Like I'm not saying like win it necessarily this year or anything like that. But I think if you can actually piece together these guys and hold them healthy for a while, I feel like you're absolutely in that contender conversation. Yeah. I mean, I a hundred percent agree. Cause you know, especially, I mean, last year, if you look at it, if KP was healthy in that Clippers series, I'm going to oh. stick by this. Yeah. Mav beat the Clippers. Yep. I think in seven, in a seven game series. And then you go on and what a face Denver Dallas plays really well against Denver, a hundred percent healthy Dallas last year would have beat them. And so, you know, this year, obviously, defense or offense is a little take take a little step back, but your defense is taking a step up. I still believe that this is a team that could get to the Western Conference Finals if 100% healthy, but they have to have enough time to gel and play together. And if Jamal not Murray might have been, uh, yeah, Jamal Murray might have had something to say about advancing, yeah. but but yeah. they definitely they definitely played Denver well. That that much is very very true. And uh, so we, you know, who knows? That's that's the whole thing. The Clippers were the worst matchup they could have drawn. And yet we walked away saying like, oh man, if they were actually healthy, I'm pretty sure they win that series. Like yeah. you push them to six. Yeah. They pulled away in game six, but you pushed them to six with Luca being just absolutely swarmed and you're missing so many key parts, right? Like yeah, we, as much maligned as he is, Dwight Powell last year was a solid contributor for this team. He was in what the 97th percentile and uh, you know, pick and roll finishing around the rim. Yeah. So you got a weapon like that. You didn't have him in the playoffs. Jalen Brunson didn't have him, you know, in the playoffs, didn't have him after I'm trying to remember exactly when he hurt his shoulder. It was January or February, something like that. Yeah, I want to say it was February. Yeah. Which so. still, by the way, that whole shoulder injury, 
the fact that there was never a flagrant call on I know. whoever the Hawks player was that pushed him down. I think it was Dwayne Dedman. Yeah, like, I think so. I'm still mad about that a year later. Just saying. Yeah, but no, like, that's besides it's, the point. It's valid in that the league declined to do anything about it or pretty much said like, yeah, no, we're not going to add anything to that. That's what was egregious to me, not just the yeah. missing it on the floor because sometimes weird stuff like that does happen even if it at the eyeball test is like, well, that should be pretty clear. But yeah, when they followed up with like a review the next day, they're like, eh, we're going to leave it as is. Like, really? Okay. Just tore the guy's labrum. Yeah, yeah. I guess he just forgot how to land. But <laughs> yeah, so... It's uh, it'll be interesting to see what this team can do this week is going to be tough back to back in Utah and then back to back against Phoenix in Dallas, a wonky schedule set up there. I guess that's part of the, the COVID adjustments on the schedule, but I'm, I'm curious to see if it really changes things up too much. I think the scheduling has been a bit of a, a wreck for the league just because of how they kind of could have gone about this differently, whether yeah. as much as we dismiss kind of divisional play as not mattering, it feels like you could have done a more division centric focus on these schedules and reduced at least the the degree of travel, the distance of travel, and maybe contained things a little better rather than having nine or 10, however many postponed games it is at this point. Yeah. And, you know, you have weird situations too, where games got postponed for guys that hadn't, tested positive, but because contact tracing was needed. And then the Mavericks have played now like nine games over the course of a little over two weeks with, uh, with four to six guys out, depending on the given night. And it's like, yeah, is it better for running skeleton crews for some of these games? Like, I don't feel like it is. So we'll see what happens with that. Is. I mean, I definitely, I'll tell you what, I wish we could have postponed uh, the Milwaukee, Chicago, Toronto, Houston, Denver games. Um, if we could yeah. have just postponed those and then kept the other ones, I would have been fine. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I'm glad. The only reason I am glad they didn't postpone it and they played through, you know, Josh Green got some good minutes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he got a little bit of development time. Wes Awundu got some good minutes. Yep. You know, I think that's a note too. And we didn't really talk about this, but I do want to mention this. Awundu and Josh Green, like those guys are, aren't going to be playing 20 minutes a night right. when all these other guys come back. Same with even James Johnson. Like I hope James Johnson is in the rotation still, but not for 20 minutes, give him like 10 to 10. Yeah. So that's something about these guys coming back too, is that it just minimizes all these kind of players that you're still trying to figure out exactly what they are. Absolutely. And you know, Wes Awandu, to your point, uh, him playing, having to play 30 minutes, some of these games it's brutal. That's not, a, that's not putting him in a position to succeed. He was never signed to do that. No, he's not helping himself either by having a weird regression in three point shooting this year. He's yeah. actually shooting the worst three point percentage of his career right now, 14.3%. And the last two years he had been, where would it go? 36.7% and 34.1% his last two years in Orlando. His rookie year was just a hair under 20%. So he's regressed to the worst position. Now, part of that is, okay, he's not used to playing 30 minutes either. Maybe his legs are juiced a little bit. And because, especially with all those other defenders you're missing, he's having to draw some of these tougher matchups. Like coming into that, um, coming into the second half of the Houston game, him getting matched up with Gordon, like trying to work around uh, however they can to to get anything to slow the other guy's best player down at that moment and create any kind of advantage for them well because he's got to go chase him around now he's going to be a little bit more gassed offensively i don't know i'm not trying to excuse what what i say 14 percent from three i'm not trying to excuse that but yeah you're you're not gonna have if they do show up on the court i'm quite confident in smaller doses they can be more productive well and so i mean here's a stat that i actually found so in in the last in that game against denver um, before everybody got sick. Mm-hmm. Um, James Johnson played nine minutes in that game. Josh Green played three minutes in that game. And Wessel Wundu got a DNP coach's decision. Yep. After that, with everybody out, and this actually doesn't include um, the last game against Denver, uh, but Johnson was averaging, James Johnson averaging 24.6 minutes per game. Josh Green's averaging 20.4 minutes per game. Wessel Wundu was averaging 22 minutes a game. Like, yeah. that's not normal. And so... To look at this team and say, oh, they're garbage. All their role players are garbage. Their role players aren't their role players right now. Now, now they, they will be. They'll be put back into their role. Yeah. So that's, you know, just something to look on on the bright side here for all the uh, doomsday Mavs fans out there that just want to push the panic button. Like, 
these guys aren't going to be playing the way they've been playing right the past nine games and, and i do think that in the long run they'll be better for having had this yeah. experience even though it sucks like having to put them in those situations like this has been an absolute crash course for josh green in terms of transitioning to the nba and getting a better feel for it he's still raw he's still a bit rough but you see the flashes there and now i think you'll get a better josh green moving forward once his role is a little bit more reduced again but he'll have gone through you know kind of gone through the fire a little bit and now he's a little more battle tested and i think better as a result of that Wes Awandu, i think he'll do better as well um in the smaller doses and not being asked to do as much granted he'll see probably a lot less court time i think green will still get a a decent chunk of time but yeah it's it's overall top to bottom i think a team is better served going through something like this even though it's never fun even though it's frustrating because if everything was still rolling great and the team was working out the only action they like let's say that they never lost those guys and they were sitting in a in, with a much better record like of the five losses they had without those guys i'd say they won at least three or four of those yeah all right your record's significantly better but unless you're getting blowouts those guys at the end of the bench aren't getting any minutes at all they're not getting that opportunity to find a rhythm or to kind of grow and develop in the case of green a little bit so now odds are especially in a year like this where everything's unpredictable and health and safety protocols are going to be what they are you might have to call on them in all likelihood yeah. again at some point in the year. And now they'll be better suited for the second time. So it's like, if I had to deal with this in general, I'm much happier to deal with it in the first 10 to 20 games Absolutely. of the year rather than, Oh crap, we're in the final month and a half of the season. And I just lost five guys for two plus weeks. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see, man. It's a, it's going to be a, a very interesting game i think tonight and week because as tough as it is it might still be rough and we'll see what kind of minutes these guys get but getting most of the roster back i feel like they can finally start to find a little bit of traction finally and you know the emotional lift can't be overstated in that situation just having everyone and feeling like okay no we're actually we're not coming out just assuming like oh, we're not we're not geared for this we're exhausted and this is a, a game that we're not equipped to win right now now you're coming out and like, all right, we got our squad more or less. Like we're not completely there, but we've essentially got the key elements we need that we can, that we can beat most anybody, I would say. So anyway, uh, Jimmy, thank you for jumping on. Um, pleasure talking with you. We'll have to do it again sometime. And absolutely. Like I said, uh, if you ever want to flip the role and bring me on or something like that, totally works for it. It occurs to me, I don't ever do like, guest spots like i always invite people to come on and i'm like oh i don't know if that's something that i should ask like do we want to trade appearances at some point or something like that or whatever but it probably works better that way i guess that way you're getting you're bringing new people in to you know introduce to your audience and stuff although i think a lot of my audience is familiar with you people have been calling for me to bring you on for a while (laughs) and uh and you know vice versa me jumping on their show so We'll uh, we'll do it again sometime, but we'll uh, we'll see what happens in the next few days for the Mavericks. It'll be interesting either way. Yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on. Love to do it again soon. Hopefully after a, a good Mavs win, and yeah, very soon I'll be start having guests on uh, the All Things Mavs channel, guys. If you haven't subscribed yet, YouTube.com slash All Things Mavs forty one. I'll be in the comments of this video, so uh, hit me up there. But yeah, man, you're doing great stuff here, and so I appreciate you making me a part of it. I appreciate it, man. Anytime, but. Don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment, check out Jimmy's channel, like he said, subscribe. And uh, until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.